Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're finishing up with AIG Canada's video on whether or not God is a bully. We've covered human nature so far, which basically boiled down to it's our fault God hits us. Next up comes God's character. Let's see how they waffle out of him breaking his own rules here. That's human nature, now what about God's character? Like you can learn through the linked resources, God reveals himself throughout the Bible as a God of love and justice. Because nothing says love and justice like, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Even if you accept the reasoning for this, that Amalek opposed Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, that was an event that happened hundreds of years before. None of the Amalekites that were alive during the reign of Saul would have had anything to do with the Exodus story, especially not their children, infants, oxen, sheep, camels, and donkeys. And yet God eventually tortured Saul by sending tormenting spirits to him for the crime of not having killed all of the animals and sparing their king. So Saul spared one human being and some of the animals. And because of that mercy, which is a term I use very, very loosely here, Saul gets tortured. How is any of this justice or love? And the two don't cancel each other out. In fact, God's character demands he judge sin not only because he's holy, but also because he loves us and he knows the pain and destruction sinful choices cause. I love you. Therefore, if you so much as feel mild anger toward another person, I'll burn you forever! How does that not contradict? He hates what sin does, and like Ezekiel 18.23 and 33.11 reveal, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Well, if he has no pleasure in it, then he could just not cause it. He's the one that made the rules and made them impossible for humans to follow, so there's no one to blame here but God. Also, notice God's character does not change. Some may assume that in the Old Testament God demands justice, but in the New Testament he's all about love and doesn't care what people do. Yeah, people like that haven't put much thought into it, or they are working hard to ignore all the horrible stuff that Jesus said. To be fair, Jesus said the good stuff more frequently than the rest of the Bible did, but that doesn't take away from the horrible stuff that he did say. You know, like that whole, you must hate your entire family in order to follow me thing? Or how about, I did not come to bring peace but a sword? Or maybe just the invention of eternal torture as a method of punishing non-believers? That wasn't found anywhere in the Old Testament. That there's from Jesus! Depending on how you look at it, Jesus is actually much worse than Old Testament God because of this. When we check scripture though, we see love and justice stay united in God's character all along. He drowned the entire planet because he loved them. He created Satan because he loves us. He commanded genocide because of his love. He has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. Yeah, sorry, I'm not buying that. Throughout the Old and New Testament, God requires judgment for sin. Yeah, and in your worldview, he also made us incapable of properly keeping his laws, thereby assuring everyone of their spot in the eternal pit of fire, until he decided to provide a loophole. If there's one thing I've learned from reading about Jewish religious practices, it's that the Bible God loves them loopholes. After all, you may not be aware of this, but there's a fishing wire that's tied around the perimeter of Manhattan, whose purpose is to symbolically extend the territory that the Jews living there considered domestic. Why? Because according to the Sabbath rules, you can't carry anything outside of your home on the Sabbath. So that means no keys, no wallet, no diaper bag for your baby, not even the baby, nothing. About 2,000 years ago, they developed a workaround where you could symbolically extend your home by running a string around it and the other buildings that you would want to visit on the Sabbath. It doesn't actually do anything, but either God loves the loopholes, or they manage to trick God into thinking that they're not leaving their homes. And that's really the only real explanation for this whole Jesus thing. Otherwise, why bother? Why not just forgive people who sincerely ask forgiveness without a human sacrifice first? Surely God has the power to forgive sins. 
I mean, you'd have to ignore the Bible to claim that God couldn't forgive sins without a human sacrifice first, seeing as how God explicitly states in the book of Chronicles that all it takes is humbling yourself, praying, seeking God's face, and turning from your wicked ways to have God forgive your sins. And that's the Old Testament vengeful God talking, offering to forgive sins without a sacrifice first. So clearly, God is capable of forgiveness without the loophole, he just put it there for shits and giggles, I guess. Even Jesus taught repeatedly about hell and showed in Revelation how he will personally execute judgment for sin in the last day. You say even Jesus, as if he weren't the one who introduced the concept in the first place. But throughout the Old and New Testaments, we also see God provides a way of salvation from the death penalty for sin. It's just not a good way. A good way would see more people saved than not, and Jesus himself said that few would end up in heaven with him. So by Jesus' own words, his method of salvation is extremely inefficient. Whether the temporary covering of animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, or the Lamb of God in the New Testament, who died to bear God's judgment for sin on behalf of those who hope in him. And there's another point of God's character that you're just going to gloss over. Why does God need something to die in order to forgive? I mean, he doesn't. There are a few times in the Old Testament where he forgives without a sacrifice first. But let's ignore that and stick with the usual Christian thoughts on the matter. God would like to forgive your sins, and you are honestly repenting. But he can't forgive your sins unless something else dies first. This is usually explained in terms of transferring your sins onto whatever the sacrifice is, whether it be the animal in the Old Testament or Jesus in the New Testament. Your sins get placed on the sacrifice instead of on you, and this is often compared with a judge sentencing someone to pay a fine, and then the judge's son offers to pay the fine instead of the guilty party. Except this is a bad analogy. Remember, it's not a small monetary loss that is the punishment for sin, it's death. So this would be like a mass murderer being given the death penalty, but if he apologizes to the judge, to the judge mind you, not even the families of those he hurt, then the judge will allow his own son to be executed instead of the criminal. How the fuck is that justice? Hey, there's a murderer walking around free! But it's okay, the judge executed his son to pay for the murderer's crimes. That is very obviously not justice. And that's the third point to keep in mind. God goes above and beyond to offer humans salvation they don't deserve. Is it really going above and beyond to make it a poorly evidenced story in an ancient book from a time before digital recording capabilities? The least he could have done would be to provide us with some decent evidence of the event. For instance, God provided the Ark as salvation from the Flood. Wait, I thought salvation was supposed to be for everyone. Wasn't the explicit purpose of the Flood to wipe out the wicked humans no second chance for them? How is watery murder a path to salvation? He only let eight people on the boat, so that's salvation for those eight, and I'm sure you'll say it led to salvation for humanity as a whole or some nonsense like that, but mass genocide is not salvation, even if you do let a couple people survive. And a bronze serpent as salvation from deadly snakes in Numbers 21. Oh, you mean the Asherah pole that Moses instructed them to build? This is one of those verses that hints at the idea that the ancient Hebrews practiced monolatry. That is, they believed in more gods than just Yahweh, but Yahweh was the supreme god. So, for this instance, God was okay with delegating some of his work down to the lesser god Asherah. And actually, there is some evidence to suggest that Asherah was Yahweh's wife in earlier traditions. And the Bible itself points out at least a couple times that Asherah was worshipped alongside Yahweh in the Temple of Jerusalem. Both these scenarios anticipated salvation through Jesus. How? How does that follow at all? God used a different God to heal people from snake bites, therefore God himself would come down in human form and be crucified in order to make future sacrifices unnecessary? And the flood. Everyone dies without chance of redemption. And that somehow anticipates the great savior who will offer salvation to everyone? See, God didn't have to take human form and pay the death penalty for Adam's sin on the cross. You're right. He could have just chosen to forgive it without having to murder-suicide himself first. But he must have his blood. But he did. Notice also that whether before the flood, before the plagues of Egypt, before the captivity of Israel, or before everyone's deathbeds today, God offers time and opportunity to accept the way out he provides, like 2 Peter 3.9 teaches. Really? Every single person to have ever existed in history has been given a chance to accept the God of the Bible before they died? 
Does that include the Native Americans who seem to have never heard of Yahweh before Europeans showed up and introduced them to him? And what does that say about Matthew 24, 14, which says that when every nation hears the gospel, then the end will come? Doesn't that imply that there first must be people who have not heard the gospel? 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That doesn't actually say that everyone gets a chance before they die, just that God wants everyone to get a chance before they die. But the Bible also makes it quite clear that God doesn't always get what he wants. In fact, that's kind of the whole point of the book, is it not? We screwed up what God gave to us, so it's God making the best of a bad situation. So just because God wants something to happen doesn't mean that it will. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that everyone gets a chance for salvation before they die. It rather says the opposite, saying that the end of the world will only come after everyone has heard the gospel. If everyone hears the gospel at some point before they die, then that means that the end of the world would have come a long time ago. Every breath God gives is another chance to repent. I'm giving you another chance to obey me before I hit you again. Ultimately, the opposite of being a bully who punishes people in ways they don't deserve from the bully, God offers to apply to himself the punishment we do deserve from him and give us his righteousness in exchange for our sin. Well, if the punishment for us is actually just a day and a half of hell and then an eternity of being the second most powerful being in the universe, then I'll take that over just regular old heaven any day. Sure, the hell would be, well, hell, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not even a little blip. And yes, at most, Jesus would have been in hell for a day and a half. He was crucified on Friday, died in the afternoon, so that's a half a day, then all day Saturday, and then he's back before dawn on Sunday morning. So not even a day and a half. But it always gets called three days for some reason. That is amazing grace. But it's not critical thinking. Isn't that what you're supposed to be teaching here? That's it for this one. Couple things before I sign off. Firstly, I am raising money for Project Share Niagara again this year, except this time I set it up through an official fundraising site, so if you donate, it'll be tax deductible. Link for that will be in the description. We blew past our original $3,000 goal. Let's keep it coming and see just how far past it we can go. Also, it was Christmas in my P.O. Box this week as I got a hard drive from my archive from Philip, some marsupial-themed chocolate from Reynardo Red, who lives in Australia, the Anchor Bible for the end of Mark from someone whose name wasn't on the package, and a Save the Chubby Unicorns t-shirt from another anonymous sender. So thank you so much for all of these, they are very much appreciated, and despite what I said on Twitter, I did share the chocolate with my family. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Ethan Shepard, who says, The anti-vax movement in the U.S. has been growing with very little resistance. Vice Rhino, I think there's a huge pun that you didn't capitalize on. Indeed. Well played, sir. Well played. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Jerry the Berry, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the critical thinking skills to the mindless appeals to the book that is my channel. If you'd like to be completely wasted on creationists, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish list, which are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my PO box address. And also I have a podcast now, links down below as well if you want to hear the whole thing in one go in audio only format that's the way to go see you next time